Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listeners. This is Brett. I'm the producer of the Online Great Books Podcast, and as promised... We return for part two of the discussion of Larry McMurtry's 1985 novel, Lonesome Dove, featuring Scott Carl and Brett McKay from The Art of Manliness. There is no overlap between these two shows. This one picks up right where the last one left off. Producers note, if you haven't read the book and you're just here because you enjoy listening to Scott and Carl and Brett talk, I would ask you to bear with us through the first several minutes of the conversation. They're talking about a specific character. And then the conversation is broadened from there. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. We'll be back next week with something brand new. I like Claire a lot. And she's got a good head on her shoulders. I think she understands people. Was it okay for her to marry Bob, though? Was that proper for her to do? I mean, what else do you do? I mean, what else do you do? Sometimes you just got to go for good enough. I mean, out there, like, who else would she have married? Her pick. But there's no Tinder. There weren't a lot of good picks. That could be. Yeah. But by time, so sh- there's a, I don't know, what is it, 16 year gap between Gus's last contact with Clara and then us being reintroduced to, or us being introduced to her story. And by then she's in Nebraska and they've got a beautiful home. Yeah. You know, she has a frame house, <laughs> got a thriving business, uh, two lovely daughters. Uh, she has buried three sons who were very, very young when, when each of them died. Uh, and, and that has taken its toll on her. But that's kind of what happened back then. And by all all other respects, she has a very, very good life, even though she's spoon-feeding a comatose husband and yeah. wrestling with all those problems. In fact, Lori, who's done nothing but live in a crappy shack, get abducted and pimped out and lived above saloons, can't believe how lovely and pleasant the home place is there with when Gus brings her to meet Clara. She can and it changes her. It, yes. it changes her. Like um, Clara gave Lori a model of what a good life can look like and feel like. And because of that, Lori's life turned out pretty well. Spoiler. Yeah. Spoiler. But it was Clara. It was Clara the model that allowed that to happen. So Clara is the civilization that uh, Colin McRae brought. But but she also understands, though, that Colin McRae, their violence is what allowed that civilization to happen. Like, she's not like the bankers in the school marms mm-hmm. who want Colin McRae, like, just have complete disdain for them. Yeah. She understands it. She doesn't like it. She doesn't want to But she understands it. it. Yeah. There are lines in here that show an insight from McMurtry that is special. He says, Clara was prone to sudden angers and sadness is so deep that nothing he could do, speaking of Bob, there's nothing he could do or say would prompt her to answer him or even look at him. And he he talks about Elmira, Lorena, and Clara, actually all of the women having an inner life that no one else was privy to. Of course, I mean, we all do. We all do. And he describes like a private inner life for those people, for those women that he doesn't really describe for Gus. For Gus, like Gus is always philosophizing and saying stuff, but he's an open book. You know, if he thinks it or feels it or whatever, it's it comes out and everybody knows. He has to speak it out loud, or he's not sure that he thought it. Yeah, could be. The women. I, I don't think that for McMurtry, they're that way because they are women. It's just, you know, the device for this book is that he gives these women this private inner life and this quiet, quiet, really, frankly, sad place that they all retru- retreat to, except for the Paris, Texas chick that straddles Roscoe. <laughs> <laughs> Gus was talking about Dish and the other young cowboys. It's another little line that I like. He says, occasionally the very youngness of the young moved him to charity. They had no sense of the swiftness of life nor of its limits. The years would pass like weeks and loves would pass too or else grow sour. A young Dish, skilled cowhand that he was, might not live to see the horrors of Ogallala. And the tender feelings he harbored for Lorena might be the sweetest he would ever have. <sighs> yeah, rough. we've been kind of picking at this book. It is a pleasure to read. The language is good. I especially like McRae's voice. I think 
I, I imagine McMurtry as the writer just coming up with this character, writing some of the dialogue and this, I need a novel. I need three novels so that I can have this character talk more. It's a lot of fun to read. There's a lot of lines that are going to make you chuckle. Yeah, Gus says, it's so hot, I doubt I could even got the energy to set my post. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's another, Newt's a fine boy, Augusta said. It's a miracle, ain't it, when one grows up nice. I have a couple of boys, and you see them, and you, it is a miracle when they, they, but they do it up nice. Sometimes. You wonder how it happened. My favorite lines from Gus is just whenever he's talking about, again, by this uncertainty of life, he always compares it to a stream. You're like, well, life's a twist and stream. Or life's a river, it's all gone past, can't do anything about it. My favorite line from Gus uh, is after the, the one of the Irish brothers gets bit up by the water moccasins. And they got to bury this guy, and the other Irish kid is just sobbing and saying, you know, can't even give him a funeral. And, you know, Augustus says, look, as you can see, we're out in the middle of nowhere. If we were in the city, would have given a nice funeral. But right now, all you can do is get on your horse and kick. Yeah. I, I, I always like whenever like I have crappy stuff happen and there's really nothing you can do. Even with my, when my kids have crappy stuff happen to them and there's nothing you can do. I'm just like, I mean, all you can do right now is get on your horse and kick. There's nothing else you can do. That's all you just got to keep moving forward. Yeah. I like that. Gus says, Jake Spoon has never taken care of nobody, not even himself. He's the world's child, and the main point about him is that he'll always find somebody to take care of him. And they did. They did, yeah. They did. A man dumb enough to bet his saddle is dumb enough to eat gourds, Mr. Gus said when he'd heard that about the bet. I have at ochre, Jasper recl- replied, but I've never yet at no gourd. Pumpkins are gourds. And uh, me and Gus think that if you eat one, you're dumb. <laughs> uh, do you guys want to talk about uh, Newt? Do you want to go there? Listen, here's my problem with Newt. I remember... The kid getting bit by the snakes on the on the miniseries. And I remember that Dietz was Danny Glover. Right. All that's fine. Newt will forever be Ricky Schroeder, and that is not okay. <laughs> like, I, I'm reading a thousand pages of this, and he keeps looking like Ricky Schroeder, and it's just... You know, that's the problem with watching, it, with watching any of these movies or adaptations or whatever these books, because... You know, I didn't remember Diane Lane as Lorena, so she was just, you know, she was Lorena for me uh, in yeah. the book. But I could not forget that Newt was Ricky Yeah, Schroeder. so Call is played by Tommy Lee Jones, and they're supposed to look like each other so much that other people say, hey, you must be Call's kid, which is another callback for me to the Odyssey when people look at Telemachus. Oh, you're Odysseus's kid. Nobody's going to confuse Ricky Schroeder yeah. with Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you don't you don't like Newt was Ricky Schroeder. Okay, let's put that aside. <laughs> let's put that aside. Let's talk about the book. Like what do you think about did Call mess up? It's like Call was duty bound, right? That was his sort of prerogative. This is like the one duty Right. He seemed to he couldn't live up to. I wonder what was going on there. Well, what does he say? I uh he gave him the horse. You know, I value the horse more than my name. Yeah. He sees his dalliance with Maggie to be a failure to acknowledge Newt. I mean, he clearly loves the kid. Yeah. He gives him responsibility. He gives him the, the herd. He's proud of him. He gives him the watch that his father gave him. Except he can't say, he can't give him a name. Right. Except that he could have. Well, he could have, you know, but he, he couldn't make himself do it. Right, so wh- wh- where's where's this valor that these guys supposedly had? You know, I it's different types of valor, different types of valor. I don't think valor crosses domains. I think it's you can gain you can get valor in one area, but lack it in other areas. Apparently, yeah. There's also a selfishness in that. Maybe he valued the horse above his name, but it's clear that Newt didn't. You know, is there? Yeah he would clearly rather have had the name than the horse and rather have known who he was than to have had that stupid, that the horse, you know, 
Hell Bitch. Which was another character in the story. <laughs> yeah, there were another, a number of animal characters. The Texas Steer, the Blue Pigs. <laughs> yeah. Calls Horse. And then they hired, they bought a steer, a, a lead steer. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he was also a character and he ended up. Did they buy him or did he just show up? No, the, the Texas the Texas Bulls showed up, but the lead steer they actually bought him, which is common. Old dog. Old dog. I love the bull and the, the grizzly bear having a fight. Yeah. That was pretty pretty good. Newt is us in this story, I think. Like he can't believe any of it's happening. He witnesses everything, but he's clean. Like when there's a stampede, he's in the dust and he can't see and he doesn't he doesn't get anything done. It's not that he it's not that he's bad or lazy or anything, but he just can't seem to get traction. He's growing up amidst all of this. He's there, but he's not really a party to it uh, for most of the uh, of the book until at the end where he finds that he's a good you know, he's a good horse trainer. He can break he can break horses. But until that he's no good at anything really except just persevering. Do you think so I'm looking at 836 and 837. This is when call he's going to tell him but he just can't tell him he goes up and squeezes his arm and then he just can't do it uh and he leaves and newt is saying in his mind go on then newt thought just let it be it's been this way always let it be captain he he knows that his his father isn't going to be able to claim him but then he's bitter about it at the end i ain't kin to nobody in this world i don't want to be i won't be so he has this bit of understanding of the problem. It would change everything that he always thought that he was. That's the problem with the episode with Maggie. It's human weakness, and it was dishonorable. He never married her. And if he admits that he had a son by that, then everything he's built up to be goes away. And he, he can do a whole lot of things. He can give the horse, and the you know he can make this guy's fortune. And he's got the first first herd in Montana. If he doesn't screw up, he's going to be rich. He can do all sorts of things for him, but he just can't say, you're my son. Is that a a false frame of reference? Like, I, mean, what, I, mean, I guess the alternative, like what, let's do a counterfactual. Like, what would have happened if he did say, yep, you're my son? Happy ending? Redemption? Yeah. He's not fitted for that kind of happy ending. Yeah. You can imagine. <laughs> so you can imagine who said, hey, dad. Uh, can you imagine that? And then call saying, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. He can say, here's the horse. Here's my Henry rifle. Here's my dad's watch. Your name's Newt call. I'm going back to Texas. Yeah. He can still do that. He can still be him. Uh, he doesn't have to sit there and wallow in, you know, his dotage and be a granddad and teach kids to whittle. Like it doesn't have to be like that. He can still get shot in the gut while Indian out on the prairie somewhere. <laughs> That would be his happy ending. He could have said, I'm proud of you. You're a call. The end. And and walked off in the sunset, but he didn't do it because he's a pussy. Would that have done anything for Newt? An acknowledgement of the truth is, um, I can't think of any. But he already knew the truth. He already knew the truth, but then if, if he got it, that's, like. That's why I said acknowledgement. Yeah. Like, call needs to do that. Like, well, like what would change? Like let's think about it. like what would change? Like would the the relationship? I don't. Would the relationship change? Like there wouldn't be like oh yeah you're my pa and you're my. I mean it just. Well, is it better to harm or be harmed? Like what does that do? Right. Maybe it's not about Newt. It's about Call. Right. He gets a chance to clean it up. Then you know he can do his. He can. He can make his amends with himself. You know, but he never he he never lets it scab over yeah. because he never he, he never finishes it. So I want to read no? what Clara says. I wonder if she's being fair. Uh, so she's really mad at him. This is 845 and 846. You haven't even given him your name. I put more value on the horse, Call said, turning the dun. He rode off, but Clara, terrible in her anger, strode beside him. I'll write him. I'll see he gets your name if I have to carry the letter in Montana myself. And I'll tell you another thing. I'm sorry you and Gus McRae ever met. All you two done was ruin one another, not to mention those close to you little further down. You think you always done right. That's your ugly pride, Mr. Call, but you never did right, and it would be a sad woman that needed anything from you. You're a vain coward for all your fighting. I despised you then for what you were, and I despise you now for what you're doing. 
Is that right? Is he a vain coward that never did anything right? I don't know about never did anything right, but, you know, he has this vanity, right? That he, he thinks that he has a set of standards and that he has to live up to those and he can't acknowledge when he hasn't. I mean, I, I, I agree that, I mean, I, I wish Call would have done that, but I'm just trying to think, like, what would have happened? I'm going to be Freud here. Oh, no. <laughs> Going back to your triumph of the therapeutic. That's yours, <laughs> not mine. I'm going to bring in a therapeutic mind. Like, but like, you know, there's this idea in therapy. It's like, well, you just got to be transparent. Be, you know, just talk about, like, put everything out in the open. But sometimes you do that and it just makes things worse. I mean, I've seen that happen. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like, what you what, tell me what you really tell me, and it's like, boy, geez, that just that just made that just blow, blew everything up. Well, and now everyone's there's more dysfunction. Well, I think in that context, people are wallowing in whatever, in some state, emotional state. They by by saying what that is in therapy, they're often kind of doubling down on it or reaffirming it. I don't think this is that. I don't think this would be a wallowing in it. This is about virtue. This is about creating a character. A, a decent human being. This yeah. is ordering your loves. Yeah, call. Well, everything has already happened that's going to happen. Like, he's already had the thing with Maggie. Newt's already here. And for him to acknowledge reality, I mean, that's not about, you know, talking about his inter- internal state or how the potty trading made him feel or whatever. It, you know, in terms of Freud, you know, talking about cigars or whatever. I mean, he's like, you are my son. I don't think that's significant Freudian in, in a Freudian respect. Now, you know, in the context of like talk therapy in that way. But once he says it, now he can do something with that. And now, now he can say, okay, that's done. Maggie's gone. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should have done that, but he can never get anywhere with it. He's in a fugue state in, ter- in terms of this thing. Yeah. No, I, mean, no I, I think he should have done it. I'm just trying to figure out the implications. Like, I guess if he did, like, they, yeah, there's a good chance they might not have had a father-son relationship. It would have been just like, okay. As an author, I don't think McMurtry has to give them the father-son relationship. Yeah. You, know, you know, he could have he could have kicked that horse and looked over his shoulder just as he goes over the horizon and says, your name's Call. And th- that could have <laughs> been the end of it. But, but at that point, he can actually do penance about the thing. Like, he can, he can... He can do something with it, but he doesn't want to do that. Like he wants to punish himself about it and be tormented about it forever. Now there's your Freudian part. Like he's getting something out of this. He's got a motivation to not. It's his hair shirt. Yes, Hmm. I think so. Yeah. Poe Campo, he's magic. I kept wondering like, what is this character going to do? Like, what's he here for? I love the character because he walks and he just, he's like a hunter gatherer. Oh no, no, wait a minute. He's a gatherer. So they're wa- he's just walking along. He doesn't go on horseback, and he's just like picking up quail eggs and like wild onions and putting them in a basket. And then he cooks up good stuff for everybody for dinner. And he's got these, uh, he's got these little sayings. He'll say, "The dead can help us if we let them, and if they want to." You know, he's just got all these mystical like one-liners he drops. I'm like, "What is this guy? Where is this going?" Like, I really wanted um, the girl from Paris, Texas, in Roscoe to go somewhere, and I really wanted Campo to get. Developed, but it didn't happen. Well, he, didn't they reveal like he killed his wife? She lives in hell where I sent her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other character, Boliviar. Yeah. Likes to bang the bell. <laughs> Ring in the dinner bell. <laughs> but like, maybe that's, you know, I, I kind of like that, that th- these uh, guys in Lonesome Dove were able to make space for all these misfits. And Call makes it all the way back to Lonesome Dove, dragging McCray's body. Because McCray made him promise, you're going to bury me back in Clara's Grove. And this is a, that, that story is based on Goodnight, Charles Goodnight. That actually happened. Hmm. Uh, because I think Goodnight promised to drag somebody all the way back to Texas, and he did. Uh, so there's some historical fiction going on there. Hmm. I didn't know that. But he gets back and Bolivar's banging the bell. Yeah. <laughs> For no one. <laughs> yeah, he just likes banging it. <laughs> That's what you need. You just need a dinner bell. You need something. Gus gets gangrene from uh, an Indian attack. He gets shot up with some arrows. Loses 
loses a leg. Uh, he's septic. Probably has an opportunity to, to amputate the other leg and live, but de- declines that. Call comes to the deathbed and he says, uh, "Take me back and bury me in Clara's Grove out the, outside of San Antonio." So they pack him in salt and charcoal, and after he dies, after he dies, <laughs> and the next early next spring, Call gathers the body and heads back, and he stops at Clara's to give letters that Gus had written to Clara and Lorena. And Clara makes a really good argument for uh, burying him there at Clara's place to turn around and going back to going back to the ranch instead of going back to Texas. And uh, any reasonable person would have done it, would have buried him at Clara's. I think. Like Clara's yeah. like, I've got trees here. It's my grove. <laughs> like, you don't have, <laughs> you know, you don't have to go, you know, makes a compelling argument, but he won't do it. He knows what the spirit of the promise was. And he, duty. Say, yeah. Duty. Duty. Mm-hmm. He knows it. Uh, th- I, this is the part I think y- you wouldn't like, Scott, at the end. I could, I mean, I'm reading this right now. I'm like, I bet Scott doesn't like this. <laughs> uh, Woodrow's on his way back and uh, he gets stopped by a reporter. And the reporter says, I write for the Denver paper. They pointed you out to me. Can I speak to you for a minute? And then call mounted the dun and caught the mule's lead rope. I have to write, he said. It's still a ways to Texas. He started to go, but the boy would not give up. He strode besides the dun, talking much as Clara had had, except for that the boy was merely excited. Call thought it strange that two people on one trip would follow him off. But Captain, the boy said, they say you were the most famous ranger. They say you've carried Captain McCray 3,000 miles just to bury him. They say you started the first ranch in Montana. My boss will fire me if you don't talk to if I don't talk to you. They say you're a man of vision. <laughs> yes, hell of a vision. Call said. It's so cynical, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like Scott probably doesn't like that. No, I, I did. I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, because I mean, I think it's true. Like uh, I thought it was interesting. There's sort of this legend built up around Call, and Call, you know, it was basically yeah. That's there really wasn't much there. It just had this idea when this old friend from my ranger days said go to montana and this is what happened it wasn't really there wasn't really a much of a vision it was just like it's a lark basically he's a largemouth bass and he just it's stimulus response like he's just a man of action he just has to do stuff and it uh and he and he's lucky that most of the things that he had done were were good that's actually my problem with stoicism one of my problems it it Yep. All of the rules are good, you know, the, the, the general advice is good. If you are in this situation, this is how sh- you should act. Okay, but what situation should you be in? Right. There's not an overarching talos to it. No. And so well, it, a call needs yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, one can be like Jesse James or uh, Son of Sam or I don't know, blue duck could be a stoic and be completely consistent with it because it doesn't really tell you what right action is. It just tells you how to react, you know, yeah. you know what your internal monologue. Could well, be. virtues, uh, to Nick and McCain ethics, virtues go back to what's the point of having virtues? So I think it's book nine in the ethics. It's so you can lead the good life. Well, if you don't have an idea of what the good life is, then your virtues could be destructive. Yeah, uh, so you end up leading a cattle drive and getting a bunch of people killed. Have you guys had the podcast, Scott, where you just dump on stoicism? It's every show. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I said that and I don't think there's hyperbole there. Like you can be blue duck. You could be name a bad person and be entirely consistent with stoicism. It's not like this is right action. That's wrong action. It's like in ethics, we would have the, these puzzles of the virtuous Nazi. You know, could you be, you know, like the, the, the world's best SS trooper and have all of the, the virtues and be, you know, thrifty and loyal and brave and temperate and all of that and be at the service of a bad end? Well, then Aristotle would say they're not really virtues then. You have to have all the virtues. You don't have any of them. Yeah. And they're so Clara's accidents. last words to call, you know, you, you never done right because you didn't have the right goal, I guess. So Spoon meets a bad end. Well, he'd rather be hung by his friends than 
if you have to. And by the way, the one redemptive thing that Spoon does in this is um, they they put a rope around his neck and having a few last words for him, and was nothing left to do but just kick his horse. He didn't cause them to hang him. He saved them that, actually. They put the rope around his neck, but he hung himself without having some arguments about, you know, suicide being good or whatever. He spared them of actually having to do that, and I thought that was a a kindness. And then McCray dies doing what McCrays do. He saves PI essentially. Yep. And he goes out according to his own lights. You know, he has an opportunity to maybe to be a, a double amputee and he opts out of that. It's been a good run for him and he's okay with that. He says his vanity won't allow him to lose both legs. I don't think that's what it is. Call and Newt are really the ones whose you know end is in doubt here. And I don't know. I, not a very satisfying book, McKay. You keep doing this to me. I'm sick. Of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Yeah, every book can't be Wendell Berry, <laughs> Jaber Crow. So in Jaber Crow, well, in every Wendell Berry book, a lot of people die, and a lot of people die in this book. And I and I did think about you know. Why does that dying in the Wendell Berry book, in Wendell Berry books, go down easier for me? Why is it than than here? And I'm not sure I have the answer to that. But the portrayal of death in these two different authors, or at least in this one book and then the Wendell Berry books, is entirely different. Carl has the answer. I have the answer for you. In Wendell Berry, Wendell Berry is not about uncertainty or civilization or that it's it is about friendship but it's about community and so the deaths in a wendell berry novel uh it's the membership you know it's always in a place with with a family with people uh it's not somebody just dying on in the middle of nowhere on a cattle drive you know where there's no family around uh there's not even a gravestone what do they put for will barger they like a buffalo skull because it's all they could find they just isolated death. E- even Bob, Clara's Which is, comatose home and uh, husband, has an isolated, lonely death. She cares for him, but <sighs> it ain't good. I want to read, go back to Lori for a little bit. So I, the note that I wrote, so she, she has this, on their way to Clara's, she's very worried that Gus is going to marry Clara and that she's going to lose him. This is her fear. So Gus has saved her, and she she thinks she's in love with him. But there's a transfer of love from Gus to Clara. And so I had this question. It was never romance, but she's, I mean, she's kind of an orphan. She's seeking her parents. That that was what Gus gave her, was a father figure, which is a little weird because he did get his pokes. But so uh, this is a quote from the book. So when Clara came downstairs and asked her to stay, it felt like being given back something. You know, and what she's given back, I mean, this is what life should be. She had these memories of her grandmother's house way back in wherever it was she came from, Alabama or something, of domestic tranquility that had been taken from her and that she hadn't had. I think Clara's house is the goal of all of this civilizing that they were doing. And the only one that can stay there is July Johnson. Nobody else could stay there. They're not the right sort for that. Hmm. Carl just said Lorena is not the sort for that. Well, no, Lorena is. Oh. Lorena could stay there. July Johnson can stay there, but McCray and Call and and Dishbogat's going to have to leave. It's not going to work out for him. But what do you do when you're unsuitable for the good? <sighs> Shouldn't you try to order your life in a way that it Well, wait lines a up with that? Well, but what if Wait, what if the world changes around you so fast that the virtues that were good for you to have when you were 20 or 30 are no longer good? I guess you go on a cattle drive and try to go back to uh, somewhere where you're useful. What if you can't do that, though? Or, I mean, should you? I mean, that's a question. Like, should you do that? Was it like, I mean, this is, I mean, this is, I'm trying to bring this to like Tuesday afternoon, two o'clock questions, you know? All right. Should they just adopt it? Like, okay, so we we met the goal. Now we got to adapt ourselves to this order that we brought. What would Plato say, Scott? Is it possible for the 
was it Timerick? Was it how do you Lovers of Honor? Yeah, the bronze. Are they bronze? Aren't they bronze? Yeah, I don't know if these guys can beat their swords into plowshares. So what do you do with guys like that? You just because there are guys like that today. Oh yeah. So what do you do with them? Then in a way that that's um, adaptive and not destructive for them in society. Some of the problems shown in the novel when they go to the bar and are dishonored. All they wanted was a drink and have people recognize them. And nobody recognized them and treated them poorly. I, the, the people like that that have the virtues that were good 20 years ago, they're the reason that you can have different virtues. Now, that's presuming this, this society is not degenerate. You know, right. So we've gone from barbaric to civilized. Well, these people got you there and they don't fit anymore. So at the very least, you can honor them. They're going to feel left out. They're going to sit on the porch all day and, and drink whiskey because they don't fit. But you should tip your hat to them and not forget them, I think. I think that would be a big help. I don't know that they can change. I don't know. Some people seem to have proclivities, you know. Some people seem to be cut out for stuff and not other stuffs. Yeah, what do you, I'm trying to figure out. What do you, I guess become like a mentor. But a mentor for what? Teach July Johnson to sheriff, like, yeah. So this is one of the themes of the book, you know, the change. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. I think you've probably all heard this rant from me, and <laughs> whatever. But things are changing so quickly, and changing so much that I'm really not able to parent the way I would like to parent. For example. I dated my wife in the 90s, actually the late 80s and the early 90s, and then we eventually got married, and it went a certain way, and it's worked out very well for us. Last year, there was no dating advice I could render my kids that was of any use whatsoever between the way people meet now, which might be Tinder or whatever, um, the, the way they might communicate instead of uh, talking on the phone that was the one phone that was in the house, in the kitchen, so that your mother listened to you talk to your girlfriend – from that, you know, which was the experience when I was a kid to, you know, instant messages and whatever the heck that might be. And of course we were under a lockdown because of the spook and that you couldn't even go catch a slice of pizza with a, a girl that you might want to meet or whatever. You know, we used to drag main street and your friends, you knew that, you know, that they would be in this parking lot and you could catch up with them there. Like everything that we did, no, nothing that we did when we dated hardly at all, it applies to what, uh, my kids are experiencing. So in a lot of ways, I'm not fitted for this. <laughs> I'm not an old Indian fighter, but in a lot of ways, I'm not fitted for this. So, you know, how do I get fitted for this? I don't think I can. I don't think I can. I don't think I can somehow, I mean, I'm a parent. There's, I mean, I'm a parent. We had kids and they're here and there ain't nothing I can do about that now. I guess I, yeah. But, and there's no way I can go get relevant parenting experience for whole arenas of life that exists now. And anyway, that, that's so you end up like July days. Johnson. Kind of. What do we do? Or you end up like Caller McRae. It's not necessarily what do you do. I mean, I certainly act and I do as best as I can, but you know, the frontier is gone for them or the world of their youth is gone. And the world of my youth is largely gone too. What do I do? You know, that is a theme of the, that is a theme in the book, I think. And that's Stick the to now. first principles. Yeah. That's all you can do. I think that's part of the appeal of the novel. If you, if you read this, you're going to, who do you identify with when you read it? And Scott said, we're, he's not an Indian fighter. Well, neither am I, but you know, I'm getting older and the world's changing. I, I guess I am kind of, I have three of them. <laughs> None of it. We haven't killed each other yet. It's a melancholy book. Makes you think, think about these things. I suppose you could live like us. You could just seek pleasure. Com well, it, companionship. Yeah. Is it all pleasure for him? Like, there's nothing he would rather have. I think than com good conversation. I, I think that's, you know, if if he goes and sees the prostitute. If he goes and gets the bottle, 
I think it's still all in service to that good conversation somehow or a conversation with somebody and, uh, you know, witticisms and whatever, you know, he, that's what he wants. Yeah. You could do worse. Mm-hmm. And, and do. I don't know about this book. It's a great story. I just can't figure out if it's capital G good or not. I, I'm not going to say it's a great book or a book that I, don't know, I, I think maybe can lead you to the good. I mean, it gets you thinking about those things at least. You know, well, you're already inclined to think about those things. Like, you know, yeah. the three of us, like, yeah. is this good? Is it beautiful? Is it true? Like all the time, I think probably, whether it's listen to the killers or this or, you know, whatever. Um, oh, the killers. Yes. But if somebody, if like, if somebody's just like, I'm going to read a Western today. And they don't have their antenna up, you know, is this going to give them a notion of good or what, what, Carl, what do you say, Carl, like, you know, good possibilities of action. It's not one of the great books. I, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about. Yeah. Just like he's a good, good capital. Good, okay. good, beautiful and true. You know, I don't know. Every time, for some reason, every time I read this book, it makes me want to be better. Okay. Wait a minute. Is there anything you read that doesn't make you want to be better though? <laughs> like you're twisted that way. Um, like, no, I read Twilight there... and it just really made me want to be a better guy. No, what was a book that I read? I'm like, this is just trash. I can't think of anything. I mean, I, I, I so I went to this, uh, so I did an article. I can, I can do those movies. I did an article about like the best war movies. Mm-hmm. And so I just like binged watched war movies Inglorious bastards. I had, I couldn't finish it. It just made me feel terrible. Nothing, nothing good about that. Made me feel gross. I agree. What is the best war movie? Bridge on the River Kwai. Hmm. The one that I like the best. Good story. And then Das Boot. I like Das Boot. Yeah. Those are my top two. I've never seen that one. I think Full Metal... I, so I watched Full Metal Jacket. That's another one that made me feel bad. was Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. You guys should, have you guys done like movies? Discussed movies? That would be a good one. Not on this show. We we did yeah, one on... Full Metal Jack. I watched because everyone's like, "Oh yeah, Full Metal Jack," and has you know you hear all these lines that kind of become part of part of pop culture. So I finally watched. It. I was like, "This is it's two movies." Not... Yeah, it's two movies, disjointed, and the first half you just feel terrible at the end. Yeah, you, just, you, you don't feel inspired. You just feel bad. I, I used to be a huge Kubrick fan, and I don't know that I'm not now, but I I really used to be. But but that movie, as much as I've enjoyed it, and as much as it made me laugh out loud at points or whatever, it's like, it's almost, I've never read anything about the production of the movie or director's notes or any of that. But my notion of that thing is, it's like, Arlie Army is on the set, and then Kubrick's like, holy crap, this guy could carry a movie, threw the script out, shot 48 minutes of Army, and then went ahead and did the the, did the actual movie, yeah. the short timers or whatever that the book was, was about, you know? Yeah. Uh no, but Lonesome Dove makes me feel like I like I don't know makes me think about my relationships with my my friends and my family. Your compañeros, uh, my compañeros makes me think about you know what am I what are my guiding because like you know a lot of these guys they don't have they don't have a telos, mm-hmm. right? And you see what happens when you don't, and so it's like man, what's my telos? Like what what's my it makes me reevaluate and go back there. It's like what is my what's guiding me through mortality and all the the pain and tough times that can come towards you. Like what, what is it? Cause if you don't have it, you might end up like some of these guys in lonesome dove PI or worse. Jake spoon. Mm. The fall of Jake spoon is interesting because he never, he never actively decides to do evil. Yeah. It just happens because he never actively tries to do good. What did what did Jesus say about empty houses? Doesn't it fill up with evil spirit? Like that's what happens if you don't. Oh, uh, you cast out the devils, and then a bunch of other ones come up and and come in and show up. If you don't have something good in there, then bad stuff can happen. If you're not cultivating the good, because evil is privation of the good. Yes. Uh, over and over again, I highlighted it, and it's a kind of a pain in the ass, sort of grad school kind of thing. <laughs> well. Jake is always saying uh, stuff about luck. Yeah. Chance, luck. Luck. With any luck. Circumstance. He, with any luck at all, he had seen the end of it, the trouble, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like over and over, go over again. It's about his 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 luck. He just, 
Uh, he is not a man of action. He, he's not a man of action. He, he, he's being swept along. And um, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. You get swept along and uh, people get hurt. I got mad at McMurtry uh, when Janie got killed. Because I liked her as a character. Oh. Janie. I wanted Me to too. see her develop. Yep. And then uh, they just, they die very quickly. I was, I was mad. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, Roscoe and Louisa, or I don't know, the Paris, Texas girl, I'm going to call her. And, and Janie, I'm telling you, that's a great story right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really sad. Uh, I was really sad to see that happen. Blue Duck. We haven't talked about Blue Duck. Mm -hmm. The bad guy. Yeah, he's the bad guy. He is a uh, the son of a Comanche war chief and a Mexican, uh, I mean, basically a, his father took captive this Mexican girl and that became, that was his mother. Blue Duck's a bad dude. Bad dude. He even got he got kicked out of his tribe. His dad kicked him out. And his backstory is he's Blue Duck killed his father. Completely bad. Like, yeah. is there anything good about Blue Duck? No, nothing. He takes, I don't think he anything. takes joy in being bad. He brags yeah. about all the people he's killed. Yeah, just does it for fun, out of spite. It is like what's the motive for, for doing all these bad things? It's just because they're bad. It's almost an inexplicable character, but I guess there are people like that. There are. He's um, he's bad on the order of like, um, oh, I just forgot his stinking name. A, a serial killer, torture people, harming people and animals and things just, just for delight. Terrible. You know there was a real outlaw named Blue Duck. So here you go from Info Galactic. Duck was born in the Cherokee Nation with the name Shakonga. But by the early 1870s, he was riding with gangs across the Oklahoma Territory, committing armed robberies and acts of cattle wrestling. He became involved romantically with Belle Starr along that time. When she married outlaw Sam Starr, she and her husband formed their own gang, which Blue Duck joined. Um, while riding drunk in the Flint District of the Cher Cherokee Nation and in the company of outlaw William Christie, the two came upon a farmer named Samuel Wyrick. For no apparent reason, they opened fire on the farmer, emptying the revolvers into him, killing him. They then reloaded and fired on a young Cherokee boy who witnessed the murder. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And he was uh, eventually cleared of charges by Isaac Parker at Fort Smith. Oh man! What? Later on, he was sentenced to hang under another charge, and his sentence was reduced to life in prison, where he was sent to Chester, Illinois, and uh, spent the rest of his days there. He died shortly thereafter in Catoosa, Oklahoma, where he is buried. Ah. So, so have you seen Blue Duck's grave? I have. And he is in Dick Duck Cemetery hmm. in in uh, Catoosa, where Charity and I both have a whole bunch of people buried. And if you're uh, if you're from around here and you want to be buried in that cemetery, all you have to do is go put your headstone there, and that's yours. Doesn't cost anything, and you just got to go pay a backhoe guy to <laughs> <laughs> dig the hole and cover it up. Yeah, he says, I raped women and stole children and burned houses and shot men and run off horses and killed cattle and robbed who I pleased all over your territory ever since you've been a law, and you never even had a good look at me till today. He just does it because, out of spite, I think. So, if you some background. So, he, he comes from the Comancheria. The, he's Comanche. And the Comanches were, they were brutal. Like, they were, they were like, they were a warrior people. They were experts at cavalry. Uh, and when you got caught, didn't matter if you're white from another tribe, they would torture you. But I mean, from their perspective, they, they the Comanche de Telos, they were protecting their territory. They were doing it for a reason. Yeah, it's right. they're trying to protect their. Yeah, they're trying to protect their. Blue Duck doesn't even have that, and that's why he gets run out of his his tribe or his band. Uh, his dad's like this guy. This kid is out of control. Uh, he he's he has no concept of what. What he doesn't know what he's about, and he's just doing this terrible stuff just to do it. But you see that sort of thing now. I mean, it's the problem of the internet. You get to see a whole lot of violent crime. Uh, but people just walk by and just punch somebody else. The knockout game. Unprovoked. Just because it's wrong. It's a thrill. Yeah. 
Like Augustine makes this point in the Confessions when he steals the pear. We didn't take it because it was any good to eat. We threw it to the pigs. We only took it because it was forbidden. It's hard to to do that uh, if you're going to start with Aristotle. It's hard to understand that action from Aristotle. What's the good that he's seeking? It's just rebellion. That's it. Mm. He's scary. That's why you need a guy like Gus McRae. Yep. You need dudes like that. That's yeah. Rough men. You need rough men. You need me on that wall. You need me on that wall. You want me on that wall. <laughs> You're going to have to do one of these famous uh, McKay weekend trips out to Dick Dick Cemetery now. I'm going to have to do that. That's, that's a good one. I want to go. So there's a, place, a few places I want to visit. Okay, I'm going to go visit there. I want to go down and uh, see uh Kiwana Parker's grave. Oh yeah. He's down there by Lawton. The last Comanche war chief. I want to go check that out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go see John Ross and Tahlequah. I can go see John Ross and Tahlequah. Yeah, that Kiwana Parker story was fascinating to read. It's a good story. It's sad. But I didn't yeah, it's sad. I don't know how else it could have turned out though. Oh, gosh. I, so I read this damn book, and I, I don't know. I'm all confused inside. Well, use that. It's, it's, this is, uh, what is it? Kicker guard, right? Like, you're, you're experiencing angst, which is good, because it means you are, you recognize you are spirit, Scott. Mm. <laughs> you, you recognize that you are in despair. You're not like the, the herd who don't even know. Which is another kind of in, despair. All right, which is another kind of despair. Because we're all in despair. We're all in despair. But you recognize, this is good. Like, it's okay to feel feel that. Because then it hopefully that will move you to seek the good. At least that's about how it's supposed to work. As I read more and more and more and more, I really don't... I'm glad I read this. Thank you. I'll start with that. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, but but I really, I really want to read stories that are really clean and maybe this is childish of me or what I don't know but I you know I want to read about good people doing good things that's why we did hardy boys right i love that writers of the purple sage you know well uh, lassiter mon- wasn't too clean monster hunters you know i, I want i want that's what I, I that's what i crave yeah that's what i do for my fun reading Right, because this was this fun reading. Yeah, it was fun. It's a really good book, dear listener. It's worth reading. It's only eight hundred and forty-seven pages. It's not that bad. <laughs> Mine was nine hundred and forty-six. Was it? My Maybe I miscounted. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad I did. You know what? I just realized I didn't really say who you were, Brett, because you know, because you're Brett. We didn't introduce you. Yeah, because you're Brett to me. But for the seven people who listen to my show that don't listen to his. Uh, this is Brett McKay of Art of Manliness. You can go to listen to his podcast. Go to his uh, website, thestrenuouslife.co, and uh, go join up there to uh, do real things in the real world that will hopefully improve you in virtue. It's hard to beat. And his podcast is excellent. He's one of the great interviewers of our age, I think. Oh, thank you. I really mean that. I appreciate that. <laughs> the uh, Dick Cabot. <laughs> of the podcasting world. I'm going for that. Are you? I don't know. Yeah, you're a good interviewer. I can't interview people. I got too much stuff to say and I just I probably don't I don't know. I'm not a good listener. I love interviewing cuz it's it's easy. You just you come up with the questions, then let the other person well, talk. Well, it's not too easy. You have to have read the book. Yeah. It's a skill I've had to develop over the years. Can I tell people about what I have seen of your process? Brett McKay. Sure. Brett sometimes is in the coming to the home, my, our little home book group. And uh, I don't know, a couple falls ago, we all, all of us men, rented this little cabin down around Broken Bow, Oklahoma, not too far from Paris, where Roscoe had that encounter. We showed up on a Friday afternoon and he had a big brown paper sack full of books. There were probably a dozen books in this bag. And he went through all of those books and he essentially threw eight of them over his left shoulder. And then he put right of, four of them and another stack. And then he went through those again. I think he narrowed it down. I was watching you. He narrowed it down, I think to two. 
and with the uh, intent to read at least one of those all the way through in the next week in pre- preparation for another podcast. So I don't know, man. You spent an hour and a half, two hours just you know going through all of those books and being thoughtful about which ones would be a good fit and which ones are good books, which ones weren't. And yep. and then you read every word of all of those books. It's um, every every single one. Do you think Jimmy Preview, Fallon? I call it, do you what's think that? Jimmy Fallon reads all of the books and no. watches all of the movies of the people that come on his show? Probably. No, Larry King was famous for not reading. He'd interview people who wrote a book, and he he had no idea what it's about. Just wow. terrible. But he's one of the great interviewers of our time. Right. Well, I don't think he was. <laughs> He's, I, I never looked forward to Larry King. But see, that's America, though. See, if you're a great interviewer, you could just interview everybody. Like, like if you're a good manager, you can manage anything. You don't have to be an engineer. You, you just have to be a manager. What is the art of a manager, Carl? It's managing. <sighs> I don't know. What is the art of an interviewer? Is it to read? Is reading the art of the interviewer? Or is interviewing the art of the interviewer? How was the interviewer? How does the interviewer practice his art? Does he practice it by reading? Well, would Socrates. you say that he practices it by interviewing? What would be the goal of interviewing? I know that the the dog trainer makes the dog better. <laughs> what does the interviewer <laughs> do? Well, I think that Brett makes the listener better by interviewing. Why? Well, I, I appreciate it. It makes that. me want to read a lot of books. Yeah, that's, that's my goal. It's my goal. Get people reading. Are there any art of manliness book clubs out there that I just read along with you? We've done. We've tried book clubs before, but they're hard to do online. They never go anywhere. Hmm. That surprises me. And if you just want to read along with me, I don't know. I mean, the problem is I'm all. I I can't. I don't have time to go back and read something with a bunch of people often because I'm just always reading for... Oh, I'm not saying that you read them. I mean, it's just like, I would think that there would be like a fan group that's, that sees what your show is and then they're reading it. And Maybe. If they were out there, you'd know because they would write you emails and stuff because that's how people are. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't gotten any. Oh, I don't have... They'd have to write me a letter because the only way you can reach me is my P.O. Box in Jinx, Oklahoma. I've been that's to great. Jinx. I try not to. <laughs> well, thank you guys, both of you, for reading this uh, and talking about it with me. You know, kind of got our scattershot approach here. There's just so much to talk about it here. You know, you could go through it in order and be thoughtful about it and spend five hours, six hours talking about it easily. But for me, it's about change of being a man out of time and out of place and what could possibly happen when it happened. And I don't know if it's just because uh, the rapid change of changing everything around me has got me all on my heels or what. Uh, but yeah, that was it for me. And I, and I wish I had seen more good possibilities of action in it, Carl. I was thinking about the two pigs that go all the way from Texas to Montana and then get slaughtered. Is that like McCray and, and call? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. We are going to do a music and ideas show here in a couple of weeks um, on Outlaw Country. We had a conversation going, if you can call it a conversation, this big long thread in Slack at Online Great Books not too long ago about Wendell, Wendell Berry and you know staying in your place. You know, if you're from Port William, according to Wendell, you stay in Port William. We ended up talking about sort of the American diaspora where nobody lives near their, near their grandparents anymore, you know? And, and uh, somebody said, hey, well, almost everybody here in the United States, their parents or great parents or somebody in the back, way back, moved. <laughs> That's why we're here, you know? And um, I, I don't know, on both sides of my family... Somebody murdered somebody somewhere and had to get out of there and came to Oklahoma. Like I think a lot of the settling in the West, despite you know what we see in the John Wayne movies, uh, was done by sort of marginal folk. Either you weren't the oldest kid and you didn't get the good inheritance and you didn't have a good place to farm and make a family and you needed to go somewhere so you could get land and get capitalized and be independent. Or your last name was Smithy and you killed somebody in Georgia and you had to shag out and come to Oklahoma and a couple generations later, my grandmother's here and then I'm here. 
the thing that the the sort of Laura Ingalls Wilder, you know, uh, Paul had a wandering spirit, and uh, we got in the wagon and made a good life of it thing. While that probably happened, I think that there was probably less of that than we would probably like to admit. I think that that country music has is an expression of at least some of that. Mm. Carl was going to say something, and then he just made that frown face he makes. <laughs> No, marginal people on the on the margins. Well, yeah, I mean, that goes back to the novel. So you, you move out to the edge because it's the edge, and then it's no longer the edge. Where do you go then? Perdition. All right, that's enough of this. Hey, go to the strenuouslife.co and sign up there to do good things for yourself. How? Why, what do you call the strenuous life? What's the elevator pitch on that? Short elevator pitch, Boy Scouts for grown men. You didn't sell me. Let's work on that. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it's, it, it appeals to some people. No. The structured, it's it's basically all the AOM content it's structured, so you take action. It's what Woodrow Call needed to do. Mm. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. What, what, what would Woodrow Call need? He didn't. I don't think he'd need that. He'd, I don't know if Woodrow Call would fit in with a strenuous life. <laughs> He's a sigma. It wouldn't be too stre- It wouldn't be strenuous enough for him? No. No, probably not. Yeah, go go do that there. And of course, always tune in to the Art of Manliness podcast. It comes to a uh, podcatcher near you once a week at least, yeah? Yeah, two times a week. Two times a week. See, I'm not a fan. I don't listen. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, and go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast and uh, you know join our mailing list there and we'll send you some good stuff. Uh, I don't know, just once a month. And uh, discount codes and things that might save you some money if you want to spend some money with us. And you can go to our store and you can go, uh, you can get Maliki, Maliki Walsh's new book, Socratic Scribblings. He's been on here a couple times and uh, that's a book that has come out of our, out of our program where it teaches you uh, how to write by asking yourself questions and other things. Pretty darn good. And we got some shirts and some other goodies there. Go check it out. Spend some money with us and quit being a freeloader. We'll talk to you guys in a couple weeks. Go spend some money.